Good evening, my Real News Media TV family. Welcome back to the channel for another news update. And in the news this evening, students among several people injured in St. Elizabeth crash. Six people, including four students, are in hospital following a motor vehicle crash in Top Hill, St. Elizabeth, on Wednesday morning. A flatbed truck transporting a backhoe loader overturned after the driver lost the control along the main road. A Toyota now a transporting student of Monroe Preparatory was hit by the truck. The drivers of both the vehicles and the students are being treated for varying injuries. The brother of the man who was driving the NOAA bus said it appeared the truck developed mechanical problems. When the truck came around the corner, they saw it coming like it get out of control. He them lost the brake or something. But when him a come down, it just like run. Then the truck go over there, so the tractor drop off first. Then the truck flick go over the tractor, go up in the air, he recounted. The incident also resulted in damage to GPS power lines and the telecommunication cables. The area between Southfield and the junction is now without those services. School where boy was found with a gun forced to have classes online. Police sources said that the school has been closed since Monday amid the reports of the death threats against the teachers. A report by the news suggested that at least one teacher resigned from the school following the incident. However, Director of the Ministry of Education's Region 5, Susan Nelson-Smith, said that she was not aware of any resignations from the school. The current status is that the school is in session with the online teacher engagement of the students at all grade levels until further notice. The Ministry of Education and Youth has not received any official notice of resignation from any member of staff. We continue to monitor the situation in the best interest of the staff and the students, Nelson Smith said on Tuesday. On Monday, head of the St. Elizabeth Police, Superintendent Coleridge Minto, said an investigation is ongoing to find the source of threats. I want to appeal to persons in the area to refrain from interfering with any form of witness or any person connected to this investigation. The investigation is advanced, the weapon was seized and has been sent to our forensic lab for testing. Further updates will be provided later, Minta said. In the meantime, he urged the parents to search the bags of their children before school. Search their bags to ensure that guns, knives or any form of weapons or contraband are not being brought into the school compounds. The school is a place of teaching and learning, and we certainly want for all our students, our teachers, principals and the staff to be safe in that environment. This highlights the challenge and the problems that we face when our children are exposed to things like guns in our communities, he said. The child's 32-year-old father, who was detained the last Thursday, was released from police custody on Monday. A highly placed police source said the man was previously charged in relation to the seizure of a firearm in 2015. The primary school, which is located on the fringes of the cockpit country, has been at the center of a police investigation since the weapon was found in the grade 1 student's bag. The news was told that mid-morning last Thursday, the police acting on intelligence went to the school in a remote section of St. Elizabeth, near the border with St. James, when they searched the child's bag and found the weapon. The constable reposted a photo of the weapon on its social media platforms last Thursday afternoon. The gun had the initials JE engraved on it. The Child Protection and the Family Services Agency, in a statement last Friday, said the seven-year-old St. Elizabeth boy, who was found in possession of a submachine gun on September 12, has now been safeguarded into the care of the agency along with his siblings. Company linked to former PS incurs a cost overrun of $23 million for works at the Labor Ministry. The Integrity Commission has found that a construction company linked to then a permanent secretary in the Ministry of Labor and the Social Security, Colette Roberts Risden, incurred a cost overrun of more than $23 million for works done at the ministry in 2019. The 75 page investigative report tabled in the House of Representatives on Tuesday, found that a $37.18 million contract was awarded to Nubian One Construction through direct contracting on March 15, 
2019 for emergency repairs of capping of double T-beams and the painting of building. But the company incurred a cost overrun of $18.64 million for additional works in relation to the contract for the repair works. A subsequent contract valuing $10.14 million was also awarded to Nubian One Construction on April 23, 2019, using the limited tender procurement methodology for renovations of executive suites. This project had a variation of $4.97 million. According to the report, the cost of variation was as a result of additional works required to enhance the layout, functionality and the public spaces such as the outer bathrooms, corridor leading to executive office, and elevator areas that were not a part of the original scope. Director of Investigation Kevin Stevenson concluded that the failure on the part of the Ministry of Labor and the Social Security to obtain the requisite National Contracts Commission endorsement prior to the start of the variation works breached Section 153 of the Government of Jamaica Handbook of Public Sector Procurement Procedures. Mr. Stevenson also concluded that the invitation of only three bidders in respect of the ministry's use of the limited tender procurement methodology was contrary to the provisions outlined in the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service Circular No. 27 of 2016. The Integrity Commission said it began investigations after it received allegations in August 2019 that all procurement done by the Ministry of Labor and the Social Security since 2016 were by way of direct contracting or limited tender. But these claims were unsubstantiated. The complaint also alleged that the Nubian One construction was a favorite of the ministry. Again, the commission found no evidence to support this. In the meantime, it was disclosed that the principal of Nubian One construction is the cousin of the former permanent secretary, Colette Roberts Ristens' husband. Director of Investigation Kevin Stevenson concluded that the familial link raised a significant conflict of interest concerns, but in a written submission to the commission, the former permanent secretary said that she was initially unaware of the connection of the principal of the company to her. She said that she became aware of Wayne Gaddis Shaw, whom she knew as Ludwig Gaddis Shaw, at the time the contract was presented to her for signing. Mrs. Roberts Rizen said this information was shared with the ministry's former director of administration. However, she could not recall the date the disclosure was made. She also noted that a contractor, being a relative of her husband, should not be the main factor considered to determine that there exists a conflict of interest. The director of investigation recommended to the cabinet secretary and the chief public procurement policy officer that there be clear rules governing the procedure to be followed where an accounting officer who is conflicted is a permanent secretary. A copy of the report is to also be referred to the Office of the Services Commission for consideration. Senate President says IC has no power to refer wholeness for FID probe. President of the Senate Tom Tavares Finson is asserting that the Integrity Commission does not have the authority to refer any individual for investigation by the Financial Investigations Division. His assertion follows the tabling of the Integrity Commission's report on its investigation of the income and the assets declarations submitted by Prime Minister Andrew Holness for 2019 to 2022 in the House of Representatives on Tuesday. The Commission said there can be no finality in the certification of Holness's assets for 2019 to 2022 without a further probe and urged the Parliament to support the recommendation for the FID to investigate. However, in a statement to the media on Wednesday morning, Tavares Vincent said, I am satisfied that the Integrity Commission has no such authority to refer any matter to any agency or competent authority to initiate an investigation. He further stated that the Parliament also has no power to refer anyone for investigation by the FID. Indeed, if that power were to exist, it would be absurd because it would allow any majority in Parliament, for whatever reason, to refer any member to the police or any competent authority for investigation. 
The parliament simply does not have that power, and for very good reason, Tavares Finson stressed. Thank you everyone for watching. See you tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. for another news update.